So let's start with this. Miami last night was the best team for the first five minutes. Miami last night was the best team for the final five minutes. And Denver was better every second in between. And Miami won. Was it coaching? Was it fight? Was it focus? I don't know. But I think it is what a great culture provides. And Miami has that, which is you're at your very best in these high leverage moments. For years and years, I lived out in Connecticut. I watched it up close and personal for a decade. It lasted 20 years. It always felt like the Patriots were better early on that first drive, would take a lead, and they were way better late. Often outplayed in the big chunks in the middle of the football game. Not always the most talented team. Start with a lead. Very good late. That was the Patriots' way. And that was last night for Miami in these high-leverage situations. But what is interesting to me is that we view football as not as dependent on stars. It's a community, right, playing together, choreography. But the minute Brady left, the culture died. And yet here are the Miami Heat in the NBA, a talent and star-dependent sport. Shaq left, they're fine. LeBron left pretty quick, they're fine. D. Wade left, they're fine. It's the basketball franchise in the star-driven sport, in the star-dependent sport. It's that culture, not the Patriots, that survived the loss of great stars. And I think what's happening when I watch the series, it's becoming a little bit of an analytic series. Miami doesn't have the size. They're going to shoot more threes. And last night they hit them. What's concerning if you're Denver is in both game one and game two, Miami got great open looks from outside. They just couldn't make any in the first game. Understandable. They didn't have their legs. They went up to 5,000, 5,100 feet in Denver. They did not have their legs. Extra days rest on the road, get acclimated. What did they do last night? Great from the outside. Now, Denver is a more length-driven team, more twos. So Denver's probably in this series going to be the more consistent offense with fewer peaks and valleys. Miami will have those, but it doesn't mean they're not the better team. So when I watched it yesterday, my takeaway was, they still have a Tyler Hero advantage. Miami's doing this without arguably their best three-point shooter. Now, he hadn't, he hadn't played yet. So what you get from Denver is what you get. Miami stole home court advantage, and they got a secret weapon they can insert at any time. They will eventually when we don't know. So it's two very different styles of basketball. The bigger lean in on the twos, the dominant center score against the team on the perimeter that will have ebbs and peaks and valleys and ebbs. and But last night, they hit them early and late. And it's such a chess match. What was interesting to me is, whereas Spo probably won three games on coaching alone against Joe Mazzula, he may win one game as the best coach in the league in this series. Mike Malone knows what he's doing, though. And what was the first thing he did? He didn't wait until tomorrow's practice. He didn't wait until his team got to Miami. Mike Malone, his turn to make a chess move. And what did he do immediately after the game? He didn't even wait until they got to Miami. He wants the Denver Nuggets, go home, think about it, get on that plane, realizing they were outfought. They didn't play as hard. The classic Phil Jackson right after the game, send a message to either the officials or them or your own locker room. Great move by Mike Malone. Disappointed. I mean, what is the worst thing a boss can say to you? Not yell at you. The worst thing a boss can ever say is, I'm really disappointed in you. It's the worst thing my wife can say. I, I, you're better than that. You think about it all week. He just said, I'm really disappointed. I don't even know what to make of it. It's the finals. My guys didn't really play hard. Another chess move. And now you've got, I mean, Spo is probably the best coach in the league, but you've got closer to two equals in the Denver staff and the Miami staff. My guess is Denver goes back and wins game three in Miami. Miami then wins game four. We come back to Denver, all knotted up. Going to be a great series. All right, so I saw this. This is interesting. We consider the Philadelphia Eagles to be a well-run franchise. Won a Super Bowl with Nick Foles. Got there with Jalen Hurts. Um, they wanted Russell Wilson. 
and they had Jalen Hurts. According to two reporters, Doug Farrar of USA Today and Greg Bishop, SI.com, the Eagles wanted to trade for Russell Wilson, and Jalen Hurts was in-house. It was Russell Wilson who turned him down. Now, your first thought is, for all the people that think Russell Wilson's washed, Russell Wilson is cringy, you could say, what a terrible decision by Russell Wilson. But both Philadelphia and Denver had all sorts of good players. He could have gone to either. But Russell Wilson turned it down. But what it really shows is the Eagles already had Jalen Hurts in-house and were ready to bail on him. So in March of 2022, they made the move. Here was the season that Jalen Hurts was coming off of, and here is the season in Seattle that Russell Wilson was coming off of, and it wasn't close. Russell was significantly more accurate as a thrower, had a much better TD to interception ratio, and a significantly higher passer rating. It wasn't close. Russell turned the Eagles down. And what it really provides is something I think about all the time in any industry. The difference between stardom and see ya is support. Do you have somebody there to support you? Almost came down for the second time in Jalen Hurts' career. Happened at Alabama where, eh, we like that guy better. Eh, that, guy, that guy over there is better. Now he bounced back, went to Oklahoma, ended up being passed over by every team in the league, went in the second round. But it also proves two things, that personnel evaluation is really hard. I mean, Brock Purdy went in the seventh round. Belichick can't draft a skill player to save his life. And I've talked to Hall of Fame executives that sheepishly acknowledge they have completely whiffed on picks. All that film, all that scouting, total whiff. First, second, third round picks. That's the first thing. The second thing, the hardest position to figure out is quarterback. And the reason Jimmy Johnson once talked about it on this show is that quarterback is highly reliant on two factors that are really hard to quantify. Leadership. I once asked Jimmy Johnson, Troy Aikman, great leader, what is it? He goes, I don't know. I don't really know. I don't really know how to explain Troy Aikman. He was just a really good A. He was a really good leader. <laughs> I can't quantify it. And the other thing is resilience, not to pout, not to go in a corner. You get beat up, you get benched, resilient, come back stronger than ever. So Howie Roseman, GM of the Eagles, one of the best GMs in the league, has gotten to two Super Bowls with quarterbacks nobody liked. Nick Foles and Jalen Hurts. And we now discover not even Philadelphia was sure they liked Jalen Hurts. The difference, again, in almost every industry between stardom and see you later, is just support. Moments of support. My dad often said, your career will be decided when you're not in the room. Lubricate, don't agitate. In the end, they were ready to move off Jalen Hurts, and now the city loves him. Gets along with people, works hard, very res resilient, leadership skills, didn't pout, Probably knew about this, by the way, before the reporters did. I'm sure his agent knew about it, and he knew about it. Jalen Hurts didn't pout. Jalen Hurts didn't care. Jalen Hurts didn't hold a grudge. Jalen Hurts wanted to prove that he was worth the risk, and he is. Hi, everybody. Thanks for watching. Subscribe here to get the latest from the show. Also, be sure to check out more of the best clips from The Herd or go watch a few segments from other shows on FS1.